Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span, and closed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are accounted as dust in the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are counted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. To whom will you liken God, or what likeness compares with him? An idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for its silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers rulers of earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Good morning, church. It's good to be with you again. Um, Have you been watching or are you aware that there is a sports documentary? And now I know that just shuts out 75% of you, but there's a sports documentary on right now about Michael Jordan called The Last Dance. As a kid growing up, Michael Jordan was everything to me. I loved Michael Jordan. My name is Jordan Michael. And I tell everybody my parents named me after Michael Jordan. Uh, It's not true, but that's how much I love the guy. And so there's this big documentary and all the sports have been canceled. So this is all the sports we get. And I hear it's really good. I haven't gotten to watch it, but I hear it's really, really good. But it's also sparked the conversation asking, is Michael Jordan the greatest basketball player of all time? Or is there somebody else? Uh, well, what I think it's a ridiculous question. Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time. Uh, but this, this debate has, has resurfaced and is raging and is raging. Uh, and that leads us and connects us well into what we're going to talk about today in Isaiah chapter 40. You see, uh, if, if you remember, um, God's people of Judah have turned their back on God and they've turned to other sources of comfort and safety and power. They've turned to Assyria and they've turned to Babylon, these great nations of the world. And as they turn away, uh, their judgment for this, their judgment for leaving their God, is that these nations that they turn to will be their destruction. And so Babylon is going to scoop Judah up, going to rip families, rip people up from the land and send them into exile in Babylon. And last week we talked about how even in this judgment from God, there is good things coming for God's people and there are promises of God that that this exile won't last forever, that there's a pardon and there is peace and there's a double portion of grace for his people because God is good and because Jesus has brought salvation. And so we were looking ahead into that. And then this next section, we might ask, well, how do we know that God is going to do these things? How do we know that God is the the guy? How do we know that we should should follow God and not Babylon and not Assyria? Why should we follow God? Let's, Let's compare God with all the other players of the world. How does God compare to these other powers? How does God compare to kings and false gods and nations? How does God compare with everything in my life that I try to find comfort in? How does He compare? And what's interesting about this passage is that as we get a clear picture of who God really is. 
And we see there's really no comparison. And so we get this picture of who God is and His might and His power and His grace. And we realize very quickly that there's no comparison. There's no comparison. It'd be like my three-month-old playing basketball against Michael Jordan. There's no comparison. And so what this does is it does two things. It, it should show us the weight of our sinfulness. How sinful and foolish are we for turning to someone or something for comfort, satisfaction, and safety? How foolish, how sinful are we? So we see that as we see God clearly in Isaiah 40. As we see who He is, we say, Oh, woe is me for turning my back on this amazing God. But in God's grace, the same sight of God that brings shame for our abandoning Him also brings us assurance that His grace will triumph in our life. Isn't that good news? The same vision of a powerful and good God that we have that makes us realize how foolish we are from turning from Him, that same vision also brings us assurance that God's grace will triumph. And so what, what I'd like to do today is I'd like to go back to that promise that God made in chapter 40, verse 2. You might remember, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, God says, and cry to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity, her sins are pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Peace, pardon, and a double portion of grace. We will look at that promise and we will say, how can we know? How can we be assured that these things will happen? And Isaiah 40, 12-26 gives us uh, four aspects of God that should convince us of how foolish it is to turn away from Him and at the same time assure us that He will be true to His Word to bring us peace, pardon, and a double portion of grace. And the first thing that we see the first characteristic of God that Isaiah points out is God's perfect workmanship. I'm going to read this to you again. This is verse 12, Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. What we see here, Isaiah says, look at this God that has promised to save you. Look at this God that you've turned your back on. He is not just powerful. He has created everything. He shows us his power and his precision. Not only has he created all things, but he has done so precisely. Do you see that picture? To create the oceans, he has scooped them up in his hand and measured them out. How many scoops? How many scoops for the Pacific Ocean? How many scoops for the Atlantic Ocean? Precision. And for the heavens in the sky, He has measured out the heavens to His exact parameters. This is exactly the way He wants it. And He has built the mountains like you would measure and weigh spices in the marketplace. In the marketplace, you'd say, okay, I want, I want a pound of spice, and they would they'd take their weights and they'd put the pound there and they'd put spice on there until they get it right. That little transaction that happens all the time in ancient Israel that everyone's familiar with, that is how God weighs the mountains. How mighty is He? How precise is He? It's exactly the way He wants it. Not, a, not an ounce too much, not an ounce too less, not an inch too long, not an inch too short, not a gallon too much, not a gallon too short, exactly precision and power. Precision and power. From the dirt to the stars. Verse 26, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these? 
So the, the idea is from the dirt, from the bottom to the top, he has created them, he has named them, he has marked them and weighed them. Power and precision. Everything God has done is precisely the way he wants it done. Everything that comes about has been measured and weighed by the creator of the universe. And not just physical things, not just dirt and stars, but what else? He knits you together in your mother's womb with power and precision. Psalm 139. You, every molecule of your body is precisely what he wants. He knows the numbers of hairs on your head with power and precision. Luke 12, 7. He knows the days of your life and they were written in his book before you took one breath. Psalm 139, 16. He controls the hearts of kings with power and precision, Proverbs 21, 1. He determines the roll of the dice with power and precision, Proverbs 16, 33. I've got terrible luck when it comes to dice. Do you have terrible luck? I never win at Yahtzee. Guess who determines every single roll of the dice? Guess God just doesn't want me to be good at Yahtzee. That's okay with me. Every roll of the dice. What does this mean? From the dirt, to the stars, to your body, to the time you will spend on earth, to what we feel is random rolls, everything from bottom to top is, is created with power and precision by God. Everything. God controls it all with power and precision. And so now Judah and now believers and now non-believers, how foolish and sinful is it for us to turn our back on that God who controls everything? Well, the Assyrian army, they've got lots of bows and arrows. Who controls the flights of the arrows? God does. We've well, got chariots with horses and we, who controls the molecules of the horses' bodies? Don't turn to these powers. Don't be frightened by these powers. How foolish is it to seek comfort, safety, and satisfaction in the created world when the Creator offers to be our King and to reign on the earth like a king reigns over a kingdom. What do we turn to? You know, we for satisfaction and for safety and for comfort. What do we turn to? We we turn to money, we turn to sex, we turn to relationships, we turn to power, success, we turn to validation from others. We turn to all kinds of things. And we see this in this chapter. We see God is, is setting himself up through Isaiah. God is speaking to us and speaking to Judah. And he's setting himself up. They are going to Babylon, which is a pagan nation full of false gods. And he is already, before they've even stepped foot in Babylon, he is setting himself up to say, look at how much more powerful I am than those phony, fake, wooden gods of Babylon. Babylon worshipped the stars. That's where their gods were. And God knows our temptation to worship and love and follow and find value in the creation rather than the creator. He knows that's where we are. And so he says this again in 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. They're not gods. Our God created them calling them all by name. He names them. Not some phony holy man from Babylon. God, Yahweh, names the stars.
And so he knows our hearts long to, to worship the creation rather than the creator. And so he puts this even in Deuteronomy 4.19, hundreds of years before what Isaiah wrote says this, and, and when you look up at the sky and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God has appointed. Don't worship those things. Well, I never, I'll never in my life worship a star. I can pretty much guarantee that. I'm never going to bow the knee to a star. I'm never going to put the star on the throne of my heart. But you know what I might do? I might worship money, and I might worship sex, and I might worship my children, and I might worship my wife, and I might worship how you view me. How foolish. How sinful. But in God's grace, as we are convinced of our sinfulness in turning from the living God who created all things to worshiping the creation, in the same breath He tells us these. He also tells us that because He is so powerful and mighty and precise, our salvation as God's people is secure. He created the universe with power and precision for one primary purpose, to glorify the God and Savior Jesus Christ and to reveal His glory through the salvation of His people. That is why God created everything. That's the bottom line, foundation. That's the reason you were created. That's the reason the stars were created. That's the reason it's all created. Donkeys were created first and foremost so God, King Jesus, can ride one into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Water was created first and foremost so the God, King Jesus, can walk on it and display His power and His glory. Wine was created first and foremost to show us a picture of the blood of Jesus that is spilled for His people. Bread is created first and foremost so that Jesus can tell us He is the bread of life and receive glory. Marriage was created, Paul tells us this explicitly, marriage was created to train us to recognize the gospel Jeez, Paul says, I tell you, I'll tell you a mystery. Marriage began as a picture of Christ in the church. Trees were created so, so men would build a cross for Jesus to die on. It's first and foremost why God created trees. And mankind was created to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So, look at the stars, look at the mountains, look at the oceans that he scooped up with his hands, look at the mountains he weighed on scales, look at the stars that he calls by name, and ask yourself this. Judah, ask yourself this going into exile. Christian, ask, ask yourself this in suffering. Can anything stop that creator of the universe? from bringing you His promises of peace, pardon, and a double portion of His grace. Can anything stop that? God, how do I know, as I'm being ripped from my, my homeland, how do I know that you will bring me back home? How do you know? I created the stars. What can stop me? God, how do I know, as a believer in you, how do I know that you're going to help me persevere to the end? How do you know? Because I created the stars. I can get you where you're going. I created the stars. The second thing that Isaiah shows us that will show us the sinfulness and foolishness of turning our back on God and will also assure us that His promises will come true for His people even though we are sinful is that God's nature is unparalleled. Babylonian gods, 
They're going into Babylon, into pagan cultures. They're going to hear these things. Their children are going to hear about these gods. And these gods have to have a council and say, okay, I'm going to create this. Is that okay with everybody? Oh, let's vote on it. I don't know. What, how, what should I do? I'm going to create the universe. How should I do that? You're wiser than me. And they go back and forth and these gods get drunk and do bad things. And they, they, they are unjust, unjust and they do all these crazy things. And that's the area that you're going into. But God's nature is unparalleled. No one is like him. Compare those phony gods to your God, Judah, to your God, Christian. Compare them. Verse 13, who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? No one. Those gods need counsel. They need an education. They need to learn not to get drunk and make mistakes. They need to do God doesn't need any of that. Who taught him the path of justice? No one had to. He is justice. Who taught him knowledge? No one. He knows all things. Who showed him the way of understanding? No one. He knows it all. He understands it all. God's nature is unparalleled. His knowledge is unlimited. There is not a fact about Everything that exists from past, present, to future, there's not a fact that God doesn't know. God knows the number of feathers on the hen that will lay the egg that you will eat on the last day of your life. He knows everything. So why should I go after Babylon or Assyria or these, uh, these thousands of other things that I'm tempted to worship and follow? Why should I go there? God knows everything. His wisdom is unsearchable. His ability to take his knowledge and make good de decisions that will bring himself glory and his people as much eternal good as possible. This ability is perfect and unsearchable. We can't know the depths of his wisdom. His character is unimpeachable. His righteous character is so perfect to doubt or question or criticize his goodness will be revealed to be crazy. It's crazy. He is good all the time. Everything he does is righteous and good and just. Everything. Everything. Christian, when you know what God knows, there will be no doubt in your mind about his wisdom, knowledge, or character. There'd be no doubt. Don't listen to all those other voices. There's no doubt that God's character is perfect, is righteous, is good. So all these things mean, unlike those gods in Babylon who need to gather together and put their heads together and really try to get their calculators out, get drunk and make mistakes, all the, for, for God, counsel, therefore, is unnecessary. Who, who counsels? What, God can what, what man counsels God? No one. No one. So why do we seek outside counsel? Why do we look to ourselves for counsel? Why do we follow the counsel of our own feelings or desires or flesh or outside pressures? Why, why don't I find this book open more and my feelings opened up less and so can anything stop the nature of God from wisely righteously and and knowing all things bring you grace through the forgiveness of your sins into eternal life can anything stop God's wisdom his righteousness and his knowledge from bringing you into salvation through your faith in Jesus Christ? No. No. In fact, these attributes of His wisdom, His knowledge, His righteousness, these attributes 
came for you. These attributes took on flesh as God the Son took on flesh. Hebrews 1.3 And He, Jesus, is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature. His nature came for you, Christian. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1.24 The wisdom and power of God came for you, Christian. And then Isaiah will tell us the same thing in Isaiah 53, 11. Out of the anguish of Jesus' soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their sins. The righteousness of God, the wisdom of God, God's very nature came for us. Why turn to something else? Why turn to something else? God's kingship. God's kingship should show us our foolishness for turning from God and should show us an assurance that He will bring us into His kingdom. God's kingship is... You cannot compare God's kingship with anything else. Not nations, not kingdoms, not cities, not states, not kings, not princes, not queens, not presidents, not CEOs, not congressmen, not mayors. All are vanity. All are smoke. All are vapor. That's my three-month-old playing one-on-one -on -one with Michael Jordan. They, they're not in the same division. They're not in the same sport. They're not in the same arena. They're not in the same universe. You can't compare them. He says, verse 15, Behold, the nations are like a drop from the bucket. Babylon, Assyria, like a little drop of water compared to God. And they are counted as dust on the scales. So, apparently, a speck of dust weighs 0 0.000000000 Zero 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 two four two pounds. I don't think I did that. Thirteen zeros two four two pounds. As nothing. As nothing. It's like weigh it to, to compare God to the nations of Babylon, Assyria, to, or the United States is like comparing a, a comparing an elephant to a speck of dust. This, you can't do it. It's less than nothing. There might as well be nothing else on the scale. Isaiah says about kings and presidents and dictators, scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither. God plants presidents and he withers presidents at his will, at his whim. Every nation will come and go, rise and fall. There will be no nation at the end that will be able to call itself weighty, valuable, mighty, or holy in comparison to our God. Every nation is a speck of dust, says Isaiah. We have the greatest nation on earth, and even America is a speck of dust compared to our God. Therefore, do not place your hope, your trust, your safety, your comfort, or your salvation in Babylon, or Assyria, or Judah, or Israel, or America. And Christians, we are constantly tempted to marry politics with our faith. Constantly tempted to do that. What marriage can exist between the kingdom of God and a speck of dust? 
Don't even compare. Put your trust, not in earthly kingdoms, Judah, not in earthly presidents. Put your trust in your heavenly kingdom. The kingdom of God was the topic Jesus talked about most. Do you realize that? He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, then in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Being in the kingdom of God, having chapter 40 true for you is so joyful that it's worth trading everything in your life in order to get the kingdom of God. It's so glorious, so joyful that you would trade everything in your life for the kingdom of God. And you'd say in the end, that's a bargain. Isn't that amazing? John 18, 36. Dude, we can't marry politics. We can't marry nation and the kingdom of God. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And how do we enter into this citizenship? Matthew 4, 17. How do we become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? From that time on, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? Turn away from Babylon and Assyria and America and, and your, your, your identity as, as Judah and come to Jesus. Repent from your sins. Repent from anything else that you seek to satisfy you. Come to Jesus. And that brings your citizenship to heaven. And finally, what makes us recognize the sin of turning to other places, the foolishness of turning to other places rather than God, and what gives us assurance of our salvation, of our pardon, of our peace, and of our double portion of grace. We see in this chapter that God is untamable. God is untamable. True religion has a God who cannot be influenced, bartered with, put into our debt, or controlled by our actions. That's true religion. The Babylonian gods are dependent on human action, effort, and worship. They are dependent on mankind to accomplish their purposes. And all other belief systems or faith, faiths are dependent on mankind. I remember in Cambodia on a, on a mission trip, we went uh, to share the gospel in a Buddhist temple, and I remember seeing the, the idol of Buddha and a man worshiping it. And I noticed in this very poor country, in this poor area of this poor country, that people would come and bring their money and bring bottles of water and food and lay it at the feet of this idol. Like this idol needed those things. Everything outside of God is an idol. And listen to how foolish it is to worship an idol. Verse 18, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with Him? Who will you compare? Who will you turn to? Who will you be tempted to turn to in Babylon? An idol? A craftsman crafts it. And a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for silver, it casts for its silver chains. And he who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that it would not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. How foolish are we for worshiping idols? You're gonna worship an idol? The thing that somebody has to go cut down a tree and a craftsman has to craft it and make it and put gold on it if you're rich enough. And if you're not, you'll just stick with wood. And then you present it and say, okay, here is your God that will save you from your enemies. You just made that five minutes ago in your backyard. I've got to lift it and put it in my backpack to take it home. I've got to bring it bottles of water and, and coins and bread. I've got to put my money in the right stocks. I've got to save my money. I've got to put it in the right bank. 
I've got to have sex with the right person in the right way. I've got to have the perfect marriage and the perfect kids. How foolish are we to find idols that rely on us and people like us? Those things are tameable. We like gods that we could tame. They don't ask anything of us. We ask everything of them. They play by our rules. And we see even these false gods, the effectiveness or value of these gods is determined by your wealth. He says, and if you can't, what, you go and you get it overlaid with gold and silver chains, you can't do that, what do you do? Well, you could spring for some wood, but it won't be that powerful of God if you just do wood. It's dependent on your finances. What does that sound like? Prosperity gospel. The things you do will earn financial blessings from God. If you can't do them, you settle for lesser blessings or no blessings at all. If you do religion right, says the prosperity gospel, God will be forced to make you rich. If you could buy the right size idol and you could put it over with gold, then your life will be a little bit better. It's a prosperity gospel. It's being preached in so many churches in America and exported around the world, and it is sending people away from the true gospel. How do we know we might be following one of these idols? Well, if, if our God, if we've, how do we know if, we, have, if we've made God into one of these idols that we can put in our backpack? How do we know if we've done that and call Him God? How do we know that? How do we know, maybe we profess that we're Christians, but we really, how do we know we're not really just shrinking God down into our idols? Does God always excuse your actions? And let's don't play games. We can take this and stretch it and poke it and prod it and cut it to try to ease our conscience for anything that we do. I've made God into a little bitty idol when His commands match my emotional state. Well, God must not have meant this because that makes me happy. I've shrunk God if His Word or His church never calls me out for sin. I've shrunk God down in one of these idols if, if my God never calls me to sacrifice or if my God never calls me to submit. I've shrunk Him down. But that's not the true God. The true God is not tameable. There's nothing you can do to force His hand. God is not tameable. There's nothing that He needs from you. Our God is not tameable. Good works do not bring you greater acceptance from God. Our God is wild. He's not tameable. How untamable is He? How different is He? from the tameable gods of Babylon. Verse 16, Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. Lebanon was this nation north of Israel, and it was famous for its forests full of beautiful, strong trees. And it was also a place that Israel thought about and thought that they had the most, it was teeming with wildlife. Be like thinking about Montana or someplace like that. Wild, teeming with wildlife, huge trees. And God says, you want to know how different I am than those gods over there? I'm so holy, so untamable, that if you cut down every single tree in Lebanon for the altar, and you took every single animal of that country teeming with wildlife, and you burned it as a sacrifice for me, you would not come close to giving me what I deserve. You would not come close to earn something from my hand. Lebanon, the trees of Lebanon wouldn't be enough. The wildlife of Lebanon wouldn't be enough. Why do I try to earn things from God? Why do I try to shrink him down and put him in my backpack? Why do I go after these other idols that I can control and I can carry around in my pocket? Why do I do these things? How foolish is that? But here's the good news. 
if God were tameable, his grace would not triumph. For God to show us grace requires that he is untamable. Because God's grace is totally unearned. For God's grace to be victorious, it would mean that there's nothing that I do to earn it. There's no, I, take no, I don't even take a step towards it, that it is all from God's side. I don't do good things to earn something from God. I don't do good things to earn acceptance from God. I don't sacrifice enough animals in the right way to earn something from God. It is all grace. If I could tame him, it wouldn't be grace. It'd be a law. Do this and God will do that. No, it is grace. Undeserved, unmerited grace toward wicked, sinful people. And that's what glorifies God. That's what makes it different from those idols I could put in my backpack. He doesn't depend on me for anything. And His grace doesn't call me to any kind of action to earn salvation. It is just pure unadulterated, untamed grace of God. So if that sacrifice is not great enough, the wood of Lebanon, the teeming wildlife of Lebanon, if we can't build a sacrifice big enough Scripture says that without the spilling of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Judah has experienced this sacrificial system that we kill animals uh, to, to, bring, to, to bring forgiveness. And, and we have to do that over and over and over again. There's a sacrificial system that shows us the weight of God's, uh, of our sin and the weight of His glory. And it's, our sin is messy. And we've had this system set up by the grace of God that we can, we can keep our relationship going with God as a nation if we sacrifice and sacrifice and kill animals. And God says, your pardon cannot be bought even by all the wood and animals of Lebanon. Well, what sacrifice can? What sacrifice can appease God, bring me forgiveness? What sacrifice can, can bring me assurance that I will receive the peace and pardon and double grace that He promises? What sacrifice could make that happen? Hebrews 10 For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would these sacrifices, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been clean, cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. You see what he's saying? The sacrificial system we make every single year, over and over and over again, hundreds of thousands of thousands of thousands of animals, blood spilled on the altar, and even that can't bring forgiveness of sins. Not even the wood or animals of Lebanon. But consequently, when Jesus Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. What's he thinking about there? Isaiah 53. When he said, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I've come to do your will. He does away with the first, with those sacrifices of Lebanon. He does away with us trying to sacrifice to bring forgiveness. He does away with that. 
in order to establish the second, his body broken as a sacrifice. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. And every priest stands daily at a service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The trees of Lebanon and the animals of Lebanon could not even come close to preparing a sacrifice that would appease God and bring us peace, pardon, and a double portion. What does it take? The perfect sacrifice. The perfect blood spilled. Jesus Christ, God in flesh, the wisdom, the power, and knowledge of God in flesh coming for us, providing the only sacrifice as worthy and is accepted by an untamable God. Verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we now have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus and by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. How do we know that we will return from exile? How do we know that our, 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 our that sacrifice will bring pardon for our sins, peace with God in a double portion? How do I know? Because Jesus has provided a way. Through his body, we can enter into the presence of God. Remember Isaiah 6? Woe is me. I stand before a perfect God. I'm going to be torn asunder. How do we stand before a perfect God? Jesus has made a way to be right with the untamable God. And it is not by our actions, it is not by our money, it is not with Babylon, it's not with Assyria, but our entire eternity has been made right through the grace of the untamable God. So, Judah, Trinity, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance because he who promised is faithful. May we understand the wickedness, foolishness of turning our back on God to any other sources of satisfaction and safety. May we see the sinfulness of that and may the character of God also reveal that his promises are for us are sure because he who promises is faithful. We love you. We love you. We love you.